Sure. Okay. Sure. Stand up where I am. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Unless you want to come to the front. Good morning and welcome to the live Wesleyan Church. I see we have one young man ready to praise the Lord. <laughs> He'll join us in worship. from Psalm 42. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for you, God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? Um, and just to start this morning, uh, Sharon has an announcement for us all. Um, we're going to start talking about house churches. So for those of you who participate already, that's wonderful. For those of you who are looking for something, my house church, it's not my, it's God's house church actually, um, that he has given me a beautiful home to host in. Happened after second service about 1230, we do a potluck. We do a lot of laughing and talking while we eat. And then we talk about the sermon. And beyond just hearing what God has to say, we are focusing more on how we can live it out. And it has been just a wonderful blessing. Um, we would love to have guests or new people. If you haven't tried it, come on over. Um, first time, you don't even have to bring any food, there's always enough. Um, but we would love to have you join us. Thanks so much, Sharon. Uh, just a few other reminders, uh, we have Women Inspired by God meeting this week, we also have a prayer meeting on Wednesday. Um, this week we have a book club meeting at 7 o'clock on Zoom. Um, and also despite the fact that we have a tree up right now, I know it looks really enticing and my first thought when I walked in today was, oh we're decorating today. It's actually next week, so next week we'll be staying after the service and decorating the tree, so make sure you remember to stay late that day. Um, also, if you're interested in Christmas caroling, uh, you can uh, talk to Magda or there is a uh, sign up in the overflow room. I believe it's is it in the back or is it right over there? Right there. Um, and then uh, we also have our Christmas Eve service coming up on Christmas Eve, December 24th. That will be happening at 7, uh, 6.30 p.m. here. And then the Sunday after Christmas, the 26th. I know a lot of people are traveling, a lot of people tend to be out of town, so we'll be having just one united service at 10 o'clock. Um, and yeah, that's it for announcements. I'll pray for the service today. Uh, dear God, I pray for just the service today. I pray that you would just be here with us. I pray that you would come into this place and speak into our hearts. Uh, God, amidst the craziness of family and everything that happens uh, this week, would you focus our hearts on you? Would you soften them towards what you have to say to us? God, we thank you uh, for the season of Advent. We thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your Son 
to live amongst us and to, to commune with us, to fellowship with us, and then to ultimately die for us. God, we thank you for that gift. God, would you increase that gratitude in our hearts and the reverence towards that incredible mercy that you gave towards us. God, in your name I pray. Amen. This morning is the beginning of Advent, the first Sunday of Advent. We're going to have a video and then light the candles. Let's start the video. Our scripture reading this morning for the first Sunday of Advent is Jeremiah 33, 14 through 16. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause to grow up to David a branch of righteousness. He shall execute judgment and righteousness on the earth. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell safely. And this is the name by which she will be called, the Lord of Righteousness. Today, we light the candle of expectation and hope. May it remind each of, and every one of us God's great promise to us. He is our hope. He is our Redeemer. He is our Savior. Let us pray. Father, during the Advent season, may we be reminded of your promises to us and your fulfillment of them. Help us to prepare our lives for his advent with us, within us. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Sean. Man. This time we're at least the kids. They went ahead down to Sunday school. I invite Pastor Larry up here. He's going to lead us in the time of prayer. Morning. Happy first Sunday of Advent. We want to take a few minutes to share and prayer requests this morning. And uh, I will begin with one uh, request, and that's for uh, ongoing prayers for Al Walton. Um, if you got the prayer chain email this week, you know that he had surgery on Friday afternoon and came through that well and was thanking God for helping him through that surgery. But let's continue to pray, and uh, Linda uh, asked me to be sure to thank the church for all the prayers that went up on behalf of Al for that surgery. Are there other prayer requests? <coughs> Dave, and then Sue. Uh, we've asked for prayer in the past few years for my sister Anne, who lives in California, for her health. Yeah. Uh, we just recently received information that she will be entering. Uh, very shortly. Okay. And the prayer is not so much for her health, but it's for her salvation. All right. Yeah. So. And I want to pray for unsaved loved ones and friends at this time that their hearts would be open during the season. All right. Very good. Very good prayer. Yes. 
She is back in the hospital, you said, right? She is in the hospital because of this low blood pressure. <clears throat> okay, anyone else? Sean? Prayers for my granddaughter, Audrey. struggling with some Okay. Eva? And Tiffany um, has reached out and asked for prayer for her daughter, Victoria. She's had to be brought home to be taken care of because she's had severe adverse reactions. So she's living at home with Anna. Mm -hmm. Uh, what's his parents' names? Um, Sarah and Tim. Sarah and Tim. Okay. Remember them as well as Jack in prayer. Remind me again of the son's name? Kenneth. Kenneth, that's right. Okay. Yeah, a lot going on for him. Yes, Mark? Unspoken. Yes, unspoken request. All right. All right, let's turn our hearts to the Lord at this time. Pray, be praising him and confessing to him as well as interceding on behalf of these needs. <clears throat> oh Lord, we come to you this morning when we lift up our souls to you. For you are the holy God Almighty who was and is and is to come. You alone are the most high over all the earth. Oh God, you are our God. And this morning we earnestly seek you and we praise you and we want to be a praising people for the rest of the days of our lives. You are the true God, the living God. And yet you are a God to be feared. Who can stand before you when once your anger is roused? So we confess that we have broken your laws and not followed your ways. Oh God, if you kept a record of our sins, who could stand? But with you, we give thanks that there is forgiveness. With you is unfailing love. Yes, with you, oh God, there is full redemption. Praise be to you 
and your Son, Jesus Christ. And so this morning, Almighty God, we ask that you would give us the grace to cast away the works of darkness and enable us to put on the armor of light as long as we are living out the few years that you have given us here on this earth. We look to the day when our Lord and Savior will come back to this earth again in his glorious majesty. And then, O oh God, you will raise us up to be full partakers of the inheritance of all those who have trusted in you. Lord, we have so much to be thankful for as we enter into this Advent season. We do thank you for that candle of expectation and hope that has been lit this morning. We thank you that this morning you woke us up for another day of life. This is your day and we will rejoice in it. Thank you for your presence in which there is fullness of joy and that at your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Thank you for your provisions and that you supply our every need according to your riches and glory. Thank you for your protection that in you we can be strong and courageous. Lord, to whom we have offered praise and confession, we come now to ask for your help in the physical and spiritual needs of those that are on our minds today. <clears throat> Lord, we do thank you for answers to prayer, and we do give thanks to you for Mark's answer to prayer that he has testified to. Thank you for that testimony that is in an encouragement to all of us that you are a prayer answering God. And Lord, we do thank you for helping Al through that surgery and that he came through that and we ask that you would continue to bring your help and your healing to him and your peace and encouragement to both him and to Linda. Lord, I do lift up Dave's sister Anne out there in California, and we do pray that in these last days of her life that she would seek you and call upon you. We pray for the persuasive grace of the Holy Spirit to be at work in her life, calling unto her. Soften the heart, Lord, that may have become hard over the years, and we pray that, that you would bring people and thoughts and, and uh, readings or things that she might see on the television that would encourage her to understand that our Lord and Savior loves her and has died for her. Help her to see that, O oh God. And Lord, with that, we also pray for all of us here who have unsaved loved ones. We pray, God, that you would, uh, again, by your Holy Spirit, be working in their hearts and their lives to draw them to the meaning of Christmas, the true meaning of Christmas. Lord, be with Linda, who has been hospitalized again, and her husband did. We pray, God, that through this hospitalization that new healing and renewal will be brought to her body and that you will give the medical caregivers the wisdom and insight that they need to help her through this time. Lord, be with Audrey at this time, Lord, as she is experiencing difficulties. We pray that in this emotional uh, time of stress that she too will seek you and find you to be the center of peace for her own life. Lord, be with Victoria who has had to come back to her home to live with her parents and we pray, God, that you would bring the help and the healing to her that is needed. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we had as a church to be doing works of service to uh, Jack and his parents. And we pray.
pray, Lord, that you would be with his parents, help them through the this very difficult trial that they have been facing for some time. Be with Sarah and Tim, O oh Lord. Give them your encouragement and your strength. And help them to, Lord, turn and, and be able to surrender all things to you. We do continue to pray for Jack that you would bring your healing power into this young boy's life. And Lord, we pray for Kenneth as he is there in the hospital, uh, suffering from several medical issues and in a coma. We pray, God, that you would bring your help and your healing to him and that even in that state of unconsciousness that the peace of Christ would come to him and the voice of Christ would be able to come through to him and he would hear that with a deep assurance that you are with him and you are helping him through this time. Lord, be with his family, his mother Rosemary and other family members, Lord, uh, to give them your strength and your encouragement. And Lord, today certainly there are many other needs represented here in this congregation and we pray for your continued help you are our great god and you are here with us to help us and we pray also that you would enable us now to continue to lift our souls to you in worship to honor you for all you are in jesus name amen Stand with us and continue to worship our Lord.
grab a Bible and turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew this morning. As we start Advent uh, this morning, the first Sunday of Advent, we find ourselves in the Christmas story uh, in Matthew. Matthew chapter 1, we're going to read verses 18 through 25 again. Matthew, the first book of the New Testament, chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. Let's hear this first lesson from Advent together. Matthew 1, 18 to 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and he took to him his wife, and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. God bless us as we look at that passage together. As I, I stand up here today, it's hard for me to believe that we're already into the Advent season. You know, this year seems to have flown by. I have no idea where it went. It feels like just a, a month ago we, we celebrated Easter together, and yet here we are in Advent. The one thing I, I do love about Advent, though, is hearing those Christmas songs. You know, the ones that we just sang. And songs that picked for uh, the 1030 service, the hymns. It's great to hear those familiar Christmas carols. Today we're singing, Come thou long expected Jesus, the first Noel. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, and go tell it on the mountain. Right? It's the easiest time of the year to pick the hymns for second service. Of course, in that regard, the church is probably about a month late. Right? Advent starts the four weeks before Christmas Eve. But Christmas music has already been playing on the radio and in stores, I think, since long before Thanksgiving. Probably since Halloween or something like that. There's an article in Time Magazine several years ago that read that playing Christmas carols in stores during the festive season is tantamount to psychological terror for store workers. According to a study by the Austrian Trade Union, by the time the big day arrives, the study says hours of listening to pipe carols such as Jingle Bells and Silent Night will have made many store workers aggressive and confrontational. The union wants shops to limit the number of hours per day the music is played and restrict it to areas where Christmas gifts are being sold. Might be a little dramatic there. But I can remember many years ago working in retail and that, that joy of at first hearing those familiar Christmas songs uh, can quickly fade away after you listen to them day after day after day, the non-stop, ten looping Christmas songs on that CD for eight hours a day. I'm not sure it was psychological terror but it probably did make you a little bit nuts. But today we are a week removed from Thanksgiving, and, and we move fully into the Christmas season. Right? Thanksgiving is gone, now we move on, we begin to sing familiar Christmas songs, we begin by lighting the Advent candle and, and watching videos each week, we'll begin talking about trimming the tree, and We'll go caroling in a couple weeks. We'll have a birthday party for Jesus. All these great things, right? And if you think about the Christmas season, one thing special about it is that it's this huge, fully immersing season, right? There's nothing else really like it that we have in this country, right? Just a, a full month or longer where we just think about this one holiday and everything building up to it. And we have all these things that go into it. David Jeremiah wrote, It is Christmas. The time of the year when we rejoice in the earthly coming and birth of Jesus Christ. It is a season when all the world stands still at this celebration. The most significant event in human history. But then he asks this, but even as believers, how often do we really focus our attention on this remarkable story? If we are truly honest, the answer is not very often. 
And, and what he goes on to say is, he says that, that Christmas becomes this, this season where we have all these things to do, right? We begin to make lists. And I'm sure many of you already have lists either written down or maybe in your mind of, of all these things you will have to do over the next month, right? Christmas presents to buy, presents for your kids, your family, school teachers, mailmen, all these different things. You'll plan out parties that you have to go to, school concerts, Christmas sweaters, Christmas cookies, all, all these different things that we do, and it can be distracting from the real meaning. Right? I, I think we all know that. Every year it needs to be a, a purposeful, deliberate decision we need to remember the reason for the season. So a quote by author E.B. White that he wrote over 75 years ago that I, I like to perceive Christmas through its wrappings becomes more difficult with every year. And so here's what I want to do through these, these four weeks of Advent leading up to, to Christmas Eve. It is maybe just for this hour on Sunday, in the midst of the busyness of Christmas and, and all the things that will buy for our attention, it is to think about what is this all about? Today we start a, a new sermon series, and we're going to use a, uh, there's a, a book by Dr. David Jeremiah called Why the Nativity, and I want to use it kind of as a, a framework for the sermon through Advent going up to Christmas Eve. Why the Nativity? Right, we don't really use that word very much during the rest of the year, the other 11 months of the year. We hear about it in songs, we, we have nativity scenes, right? This year we had this, this awesome nativity scene up here, right? And, and it work as a great centerpiece for this entire study when we ask ourselves, why the nativity? Right? We use them as decoration, we have them in their homes, but, but what is it all about? And I'm sure we could shoot up our hands, and I'm sure there are lots of kids downstairs that would, would shoot up their hands and answer that question, right? What is Christmas all about? They'd say, well, it's about the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. And that's true, right? Christmas is a celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ. But it's also so much more. Maybe better said, we should say, contained in that birth of Jesus is so much more. David Jeremiah writes in the introduction of that book, this was a moment of fulfillment. This was the culmination of hundreds of years of prophecy, from Genesis to Isaiah to Micah. The Old Testament is filled with prophecies concerning the Messiah. These ancient words regarding not only his coming, but also the manner of his coming. The location of his birth, his ancestry, his life, and even his death. A story that started in the Garden of Eden ended on a hill in Jerusalem. But this is also a story about God's people. About their need for a Savior. About their need for a sacrifice that would cover their sins forever. He says this is a story about salvation. And so for the next few weeks leading up to, to Christmas Eve... I want us to take this journey together and ask ourselves why. Right? To, to look at why. Right? We know these stories. Right? You've heard them year after year after year, the Christmas story. But I want us to ask ourselves why. Right? As we, as we know the main story, begin to peel back some of the layers and dig deeper into why the nativity. And today we begin in Matthew's Gospel and we begin with Joseph. Right? Why Joseph? He's an important part of the nativity, but, but why is he here? And as we go through this sermon, I, I want you to look at that figure up there and ask yourself, why is he there? Right? Why him? Why this, this man in history? Why is Joseph a part of this story? Here's Joseph. Matthew begins his gospel after 400 years of silence, right, from, from Malachi to Matthew. And, and Matthew, again, begins us begins to give us the Word of God. Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Right? And, and Matthew has chosen to begin his gospel with this genealogy of the Messiah. Right? This is what the, the world in darkness has been waiting for, a coming Messiah. Verse 16 reads this, Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. Right? In that verse 16, we are introduced to Joseph. The whole section we read this morning, Joseph is the main character. I was thinking this week that if you were 
picking up the New Testament for the very first time, and you had no idea what it was about, you just picked it up as a brand new book, and you started to read it, as you read it, you would begin to think, maybe Joseph is the main character. Right? The whole story this morning is all about Joseph. Right? He is the first active character in the New Testament. But who is Joseph and, and why Joseph? Right? Well, you know, we can note those things that we've heard for years and years, right? Joseph was a carpenter. Joseph was from Nazareth. But why did God choose him? You know, it's interesting as we look at our, our modern culture, how many people have this desire to be to be famous, right? We've kind of built a, a culture around social media and likes and followers. I think it was Francis Chan, who I heard in a sermon once say that if you could take a person from 100 years ago and pluck them out of history and, and bring them to today, they could never believe that every single person would have a social media site dedicated to themselves. Right? So we could never imagine that there would come a day when everyone else thought they were important enough to have their own social media site where they could tell you, here's what I ate for breakfast, here's where I went for a walk yesterday, here's me doing a silly little dance, and, and of course, here's my opinion on something I know very little about and have no expertise in. But I would guess that Joseph would not have been a big social media guy, right? Joseph wasn't chasing after fame. But it says in verse 19, he was a righteous man. You'd wonder what the impact might be on our society if we had people who were chasing after righteousness instead of chasing after likes and follows and popularity. But I want us to pause this moment to think about what was the situation that God took Joseph, who by all accounts is minding his own business, and God plucks Joseph up and he puts him into this situation. Howard Eddington, in his book, The Forgotten Man of Christmas, Joseph's Story, writes, Here we have Joseph, a man who was chosen to be the adoptive father of our Lord, the one who would protect the infancy of the Savior of the world. In the word of God, Joseph stands silent. Well, think about that. In the word of God, Joseph stands silent. He is spoken to, he is spoken about, but not a single syllable crosses his lips. He is viewed by many people as just a bit player, an extra in the Christmas drama. And I always think that's amazing to think about, that Joseph never utters a single word in the Gospel of Matthew. He never says anything. Right? If you want to be in the nativity drama, but you are nervous about memorizing lines or speaking in front of a crowd, just pick Joseph. Right? Joseph gets to stand right in the middle, but he never actually has to say anything. David Jeremiah wrote, he appears on the scene for a moment, and then he disappears. So Joseph wasn't famous, Joseph wasn't talkative, and guess what? He wasn't rich either. In Luke 2, 23-24, Jesus is presented to the te temple as a, as a baby, and it reads this, Now when the days of Mary's purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So here you have Jesus, he's this young baby, he's brought to the temple, he's presented to the Lord, and Joseph and Mary, his parents, offer this, this offering to the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Well, why is that significant? Well, in Leviticus 12, 6 through 8, it says this. When the days for purification are fulfilled, right, talking about a woman who's given, has had a child, whether for a son or a daughter, she shall bring to the priest a lamb of the first year as a burnt off. This is the law for her who is born a male or a female. And if she is not able to bring a lamb, then she may bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons. And I was thinking about how amazing this is that God gives this provision in the law that you're supposed to bring a, a young lamb as a sacrifice. You have a child, bring a lamb to the temple to dedicate it, right? But if you aren't able to, meaning if you are not wealthy enough to afford that lamb or your family is unable to get this lamb, you can bring the second provision, these two turtle doves or two pigeons. 
So here is Jesus, the Son of God, presented at the temple, and his parents have to offer the lower tier sacrifice, right? They go to the temple, and they aren't even wealthy enough to offer a lamb like they're supposed to. They have to go to kind of the, the second provision and say, okay, well, we, we can afford these two birds, so offer two birds. That just kind of blows your mind, right? The humbleness we often talk about that Jesus was born into. Right? God could have chosen any parents for his son. And yet he chooses these two humble people that can't even afford a lamb for the sacrifice. So Joseph is not famous. Joseph is not wealthy. And guess from the outside, from the world's opinion, he's quite ordinary. But here's the first awesome thing to grasp in the Christmas story. God displays how he can take an ordinary person and accomplish extraordinary things. God displays how he can take an ordinary person and accomplish extraordinary things. I don't know how many famous people have I ever come out of Kirkville, New York. But here's the thing of hope. God is the one that provides the extraordinary. Right? He's looking for people with their hearts and with character. Individuals who will walk by faith and trust him, right? As we look through the Bible over and over again, right? He uses Moses, who is, who is leading sheep on the backside of some hill in the desert. He uses Gideon, who's hiding down in a wine press because he's afraid and he's, he's trying to sift wheat down in a hole. He uses this ruddy little shepherd boy, the youngest of his family, to become king over Israel and David. God excels in doing extraordinary things through ordinary people. And Mary and Joseph are a picture of that. So let's look at Joseph's journey here. And it begins in verse 18 with Joseph's discovery of Mary's baby. Look at verse 18. Joseph's discovery of Mary's baby. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with a child of the Holy Spirit. All right, now we... We all know this story, right? We've read it many, many times, but, but think about being Joseph in this moment. Right? How would you act? Right? Here's your fiancé. They're engaged, but they're not married yet. And surprise, Mary is with a child. Right? There, there's a shock there, right? Joseph's discovery of Mary's baby immediately leads into point two, Joseph's dilemma over Mary's baby. Right? And we can kind of easily overlook this dilemma because we're kind of looking down from God's perspective. But think about what happens there. Look at verse 19. Here's the dilemma Joseph was in. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man or a righteous man, not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. We, we know what happened. Right? We, we can kind of read the story and we know what's happening, but imagine what was running through Joseph's mind. Right? Again, put yourself in, in that situation. Here's Joseph's and mine, and his, his fiance is suddenly pregnant, right? There's not a whole lot of options there, probably in his mind. Right? Probably, I'm thinking option number one, the primary thing he would have thought at first is, as well as everyone else's, is that Mary has gone and slept with someone else, right? Mary has been unfaithful to him, right? His engaged fiancé has been unfaithful, right? Imagine the heartbreak of Joseph, right? He could be angry. He could have felt betrayed. He could have sought revenge. But here's the key. Joseph did not initially know what was going on. Right? He didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit. He didn't know anything about... This being the child of God. All he knows is that his fiance is suddenly pregnant and it's not his child. And, and, and he's trying to figure that out. In verse 19 again it says, Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. Right? Well, that verse tells us a lot about why Joseph is up there. It tells us a lot about his character. Because it immediately answers that question, why Joseph? Well, we're told Joseph is a righteous man. Well, as a righteous man, his reputation was at stake. Right? Think about, here's Joseph, and he's caught. He's a righteous man. Suddenly, everybody thinks his wife has gone unfaithful on him. He'd be, he'd be a fool to, to stay with her because of what the crowd thinks. 
They probably could think that he was unrighteous because maybe, maybe he slept with her. And so Joseph has all these problems of uh, trying to be a righteous person in this situation, but we also see his grace and concern, right? This is Joseph's heart. Because it said he did not want to publicly shame Mary. What does it tell us about Joseph that he's trying to shield the person who, who has just broken his heart? And, and he decides that he'll just divorce her quietly. You know, we've talked about this in the past, but there's always this constant tension in the Word of God between love and righteousness, between justice and mercy. And, and here is Joseph trying to keep them in balance, right? This is a, a gut-wrenching decision for this righteous man of what do I do now? And, and he's trying to be obedient to God. And that brings us to the third point of Joseph's dream about Mary's baby. Look at verse 20 with me. But when he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. You know, we've asked ourselves many times, especially in that previous sermon series when we talked about Joel, you know, we asked ourselves, does God still speak to us? Does God still speak to people in the world? And, and the answer is yes. And, and we can learn something here because, one, Joseph is a just man. He's seeking the Lord's will about this. You look at the beginning of verse 20, it says he's thinking about it. Some Bibles say he's contemplating it, right? He's churning over it. He's, he's wrestling with this decision about what to do. He didn't act in anger. Right? He didn't act in emotion. He, he's thinking. He's giving time for God to speak. How important is it to give God time to speak? Give time for Jesus to speak to you. And I want you to think about this. How precious those words must have been to Joseph when he finally hears them. Right? This is his dilemma. But here comes God, and God explains it to him. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. You know, Joseph, don't be afraid. I mean, how often do we need to hear that today? Don't be afraid. Don't hesitate to take Mary as your wife. And then the angel gives him this instruction in verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and you, you, Joseph, shall call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. Right, Joseph, you have a, a purpose in this. Joseph, you aren't just an extra. You aren't just a silent person up on the stage. You have a purpose, Joseph. You weren't just there for the ride, Joseph. I want you to name him Jesus. We skip down to verse 25, and what do you see at the end? And he called his name Jesus. And here again is the character of Joseph. Of ask ourselves, why Joseph? Well, Joseph responds with obedience. And then we get this moment for Joseph, right? Think about how God blesses him because he reveals his plan to him. Right? At the end of verse 21 says, For he shall save his people from their sins, so all this which was done might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel which is translated, God with us. Right? The angel reveals his whole plan here, this, this amazing plan to Joseph. Well, maybe Joseph went to bed that night, and his only concern was, right, should I marry her? Should I not marry her? Should I divorce her? Not divorce her? And, and yet God speaks more into his life. And I think that's so true for us, right? It's steps of of faith and obedience. Right? Are we faithful in the small things before God reveals the big things? Right? Don't ask God to reveal plans for your life if you're not willing to be obedient in the present. That's not how the Lord works. Right? If you have sin and, and disobedience in your life, it will always cloud you from hearing God's voice. You say, Holy God, 
But Joseph is taking these small steps of faith, and, and the Lord keeps leading him, right? As you read the entire Gospel of Matthew, this beginning part, over and over again, God takes Joseph on these little steps. Joseph, okay, I want you to go here. Okay, take Mary as your wife. Okay, now I want you to go here, and, and you're going to do this. And then he's leading Joseph through this journey, just taking him in bite-sized parts throughout the journey. Wasn't that how God works with us, too? Right? Sometimes we want God to reveal the whole end of the story. God, tell me where I'm going to be in 20 years. God, tell me what I'm going to do. God, tell me where I'm supposed to go. God, tell me all these questions. Who am I supposed to marry? Where am I supposed to go to college? All these questions of life. And God says, no, I want you to go from here to there, and then I'll show you the next thing. Be obedient today, and then I will take care of tomorrow. Well, that brings us to the last point, and it's Joseph's decision about Mary's baby. Look at the last two verses again. Verse 24, Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded. And he took to him his wife, and he did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Right? Everything the angel had told him to do, guess what? Joseph did. Take Mary, your wife, call the son's name Jesus. Max Dakota describes Joseph as being caught between what God says and what makes sense. What God says and what makes sense, right? Have you ever been there? Right? Have you ever been to a place where you're, you're caught between what God says and what seems to make sense? Yes. Yeah. Yet Joseph didn't let his confusion disrupt his obedience. And that's a key for all of us. Joseph did not let his confusion disrupt his obedience. He didn't know everything, but he did what he knew. And friends, that's what much of this life is, this side of heaven. We don't know it all. We won't understand everything. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13, 9, we know in part. It is not do I understand everything. It is am I willing to be obedient in what I do? No. Do I know Jesus well enough to trust him even in my partial understanding? You know, as we enter Advent... My guess is right now some of you are going through things in life that you are not understanding in full, right? Why am I going through this? I don't know what to do next. Joseph did not understand what was going on either, but he decided to trust the Lord as far as he could. Because of that, right, we, we see this figure up here in the scene. Why Joseph? Not because he was wealthy, not because he was famous but because he was obedient, right? He had, the, he had his heart right. He had his character right. God could use him, and, and God is still looking for people like that today. The story of the nativity, beginning right here with Joseph, is that God can take ordinary people, you and me, and he can accomplish extraordinary things. Howard Eddington again wrote, one of the lessons that comes from the life of Joseph is this, the most important thing in the whole world can happen to the least important people in the world. That the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords could take up residence in the most ordinary lives, and that the greatest somebody who ever lived can come to nobodies like Joseph and Mary, and like you, and like me. I don't know how many of you ever heard the name Stephen Olford. He was a famous pastor decades ago, a famous evangelist. And Stephen Olford influenced a lot of great Christians that are more famous today, Billy Graham and Charles Stanley and Adrian Rogers. Billy Graham said Olford was the person who most influenced his ministry. But Olford, when he was young, didn't really have anything to do with the Lord. He was just a, a young man uh, trying to enjoy life, living life. He was an engineering student at college, but most of his free time he just spent driving his motorcycle throughout the countryside of England, just trying to live life find fun and enjoyment. And as Olford one day was riding through the countryside uh, in England, it was raining and cold, and he had this horrible motorcycle accident way out in the middle of nowhere in England. So he crashes his motorcycle, he's all wrapped up, and he lays out there in the road in the middle of nowhere for hours and hours in the cold and rain. 
And by the time somebody finally found him, they, they rushed him to the hospital, but he already had pneumonia, and the doctor said he only has about two weeks to live because he sat out there in this horrible condition for so long. Well, Olford's dad was a, a missionary in Angola back then, and, and he had written a letter to his son weeks and weeks before this terrible accident. He had to send it by boat from Angola to England. And Olford said as he was laying in the hospital, told that he only has, at this point, only a week to live, he finally receives this letter from his dad. And at the top of the letter are these words. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Olford said those words so stabbed my heart that I gathered my strength. I pulled myself out of the hospital bed. I kneeled down and prayed, Lord, you have won. I now owe you, own you as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And Lord, if you will heal my body, I will serve you anywhere, anytime, and at any cost. I guess they say the, the rest is history, right? The Lord healed all for it. He went on to have a, a powerful ministry that impacted millions of people. And he went on to serve Jesus the rest of his life. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. You know, if you ask me, why, why Joseph? Well, I think it's because Joseph prayed that same prayer as Alford. I will serve you, Lord, anywhere, anytime, and at any cost. May that be our prayer as well. Let us pray together. Dear Holy Father, we come to you this morning on this first Sunday of Advent, a Sunday of hope and expectation. Lord, as we begin to look forward to uh, four weeks from now as we will celebrate Christmas Eve and Christmas and the birth of a Savior. And Father, in the midst of this busyness and this busy season, help us to look at this man, Joseph. A man that you chose for a great, noble cause, but he wasn't wealthy, he wasn't famous. He speaks no lines in this Christmas drama. But yet, Lord, you chose him because of his heart and his obedience. Father, this morning, may we be, may we have the heart of Joseph. May we be the type of people that will recognize that our lives are meant to be in service to you. There's so many things in the world that take our attention, so many things that we strive after, so many things that seem so important in the moment. But Lord, may we recognize it. This life will soon be passed, and only what we've done for you will last. So Father, I'm praying that there are at least a few people here this morning that will pray that prayer. I will serve you anywhere, anytime, and at any cost. Father, may we be more like Joseph this morning. And may we be found faithful in the big parts of life and the small parts of life, wherever you've called. We pray this in your name. Amen. Would you please stand as we close in worship together?
Jesus Christ himself, and God, even our Father, which has loved us and is giving us an everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good work and deed in his name. Amen. 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 Amen.